Welcome to 101. I'm Greg Bassey, your host from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper. It's a big day here at PAC 14. They don't get much bigger. We've got a big fish in the house. Julie Giordano, our county executive. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Very so, excited to be here. So last week on Thursday, you celebrated your first 100 days as county executive. Mm -hmm. Sure did. It was a big day. It was a big day. So we started with the uh, state of the county and then we had kind of a celebration afterwards um, later on in the evening. So it was a good day. So you marked this with a presentation of your department heads. Now, normally what we see in these state of the county or state of the city events is the, the figurehead gives the long speech. I think one year Jake Day did bring some um, department heads in during the, during the pandemic when there wasn't really the same kind of audience. But you did that yesterday or Thursday, uh, brought your team in, and you stressed how the team is working to make things better for the county. Talk about that for me. Yeah, so I was planning on kind of doing the very traditional approach, and as I was uh, piecemealing everything together, I realized it kind of was important for them to be able to showcase what's going on in their department, and they've done such a great job at kind of embracing me as executive and embracing the vision that I have, um, or what I'd like to see in the county, or what the administration would like to see you know, going on in the county. And I I really wanted to showcase that. They've really been working so hard and we've had so many great things happen um, in the last hundred days and even the last couple months. And so I found it important for them to be able to, um, again, showcase that. But also, I wanted people to see them. You know, you may hear the name Steve Miller, or you might hear the name Laurie Carter, but I really wanted a face with a name and so people can really kind of give props where they're deserved. And I tease them all the time and now they know who to come to if there's a complaint. So. <laughs> Well, and you made the point that you could hear the passion in their voices when they were talking about their, their areas of, of expertise. And that was really true sitting there in the audience to hear them talk. They were very enthusiastic about their jobs and about serving the public. They are, you know, and so, um, you know, thinking about different uh, concerns that citizens have, you know, a lot of people have been talking about the litter on the roads. And I thought it was important for Heather, our new acting uh, director of, or, sorry, director of public works, to reiterate how much litter they have picked up. Um, there's been a lot of complaints about Cove Road. And so I wanted people to hear from Steve, you know, saying, hey, we're working on this. We're working to expand the beach, um, you know anything that's going on with planning and zoning, I wanted them to know, hey, we've got this customer bill of rights now. So I think hearing it from the department heads makes a big difference, you know, rather than just coming from me. And, you know, it's not just me up there, you know, it's, it's you know, a bunch of people working really hard to make this county function. And so I found it important to, uh, you know, show people that. Well, not to hit this too hard, but that's one of the things that struck me because you're very dynamic in terms of your leadership, you know, and there's a spotlight on you all the time. But you were sh you were sharing that spotlight with these other people, mm -hmm. and I could tell that you are you're putting yourself in a position to rely on their advice to help you do your job, and that's not always true with leaders. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that um, even from the beginning, I've kind of said I know I don't know every single thing, and so I need to rely on them, um, and they are the experts, and I've had those conversations with them that I will support them um, as long as you know we're all in agreement with everything, but I will back them a hundred percent, and I think that that's just kind of reiterated that. So what's the learning curve been like? Is the job what you thought it was going to be? Is it harder? Is it easier? Or is it about what you expected? Um, it's, it, you know, I think it's what I expected. Um, it's definitely not teaching. Um, I miss sometimes having a bell schedule to follow. I thought that would be the one thing that I would love to get rid of. Um, but I actually sort of miss that because it's a very concise schedule and a very on-time schedule. Um, and so with this, you know, you just never know what you're going to walk into. Um, what I have learned, though, is that this job is like an iceberg, where what people see is just about this much and there's so much more that we do um, but I love it I love coming to work every single day and um, when I leave and turn out the lights of my office I ask myself you know what did I do to help the county today what did we do to help the people of Wacomico County so I'm loving the job um, we've been you know very active in Annapolis we've gone to DC um, and I think some people have even questioned that why is she going why is she doing that but I think people need to understand like how active that we need to be with our delegation um, and you know state and federal level um, to make sure that we're you know taking care of everything here but no i really do love the job it's been yeah, great thus far. it's that time of year and you've got to show your face in annapolis that's just a fact absolutely and actually we've been thanked you know by several of the delegation or the chair the, the committee chairs have thanked us you know coming from the shore um and you know having a voice here it, it hasn't happened in a little bit so i think that they were very happy to see that now the biggest thing you work on every year is about to happen uh the the county budget for fiscal 24. yes what 
should we look for in Julie Giordano's first budget? Hmm. Well, um, first thing, and what I tried to reiterate is that I want to take care of our employees. Um, we need to make sure uh, to keep on working on those uh, recruitment and retainment efforts. Um, so we were really focusing on that. Um, we were doing great, and then we got the notice of the write down, and that um, you know has kind of put a constraint on some things. So I think it's eighty-seven million this year. I don't think it's going to affect us too much, but it's four hundred million next year, um, and so that is really kind of affecting you know the direction that we're going to go and we really have to figure out what is important but again I want to take care of you know the people here I want to try to put more money in our people's pockets because you know I mean you cut taxes and things like that I mean your economy is going to thrive so um, but like I said we're really trying to uh, figure out what is important um, and what's going to keep you know our county functioning and making sure that we have those positions filled. Any idea what you might do with school board? So right now, I think our maintenance of effort was sitting right under 50 million. Um, and actually, depending on Kerwin, um, we've been kind of thrown that uh, po potentially could go up to about, I think it was 50.4. I think we're going to go ahead and just do that extra bit because it's a lot easier to do that right from the beginning as opposed to having to kind of rework almost a million dollars uh, back into the budget if you know it's coming down from the state. So right now, it'll look like a little bit above maintenance of effort, um, but it could be because of potentially of what's coming down with Kerwin. Any chance of a property tax cut um, in, in addition to the two cents that's going to be mandated? That's something that Pam is working on right now. So Pam Olin, my director of finance. Um, and like I said, any way, shape, or form that I can put more money in the pockets of citizens is what we're going to try to do. Um, and so, yeah, so she's kind of crunching those numbers right now. We literally just finished up our budget meetings last week. What's your strategy going to be for dealing with them going into the budget? I guess it's due to them like April 19th or something like that. I think the biggest thing that I want them to understand is that what I'm presenting to them is what's very important to our department heads. Um, I, I think one of my biggest concerns um, is I understand that there's checks and balances, um, and it's just another frustration, I think, that there's not really checks and balances with their budget, so they, nobody can see their <laughs> budget, and it's and it's very frustrating to me because yeah. I've seen what's been asked, um, and so I'm going to be having some conversations um, with a couple of the council um uh, members um, due to that. But um, I really hope that they realize, you know, that there's not a lot of frivolous spending. When we were looking at everything, um, everything was really in line. There wasn't anything that seemed so astronomical. You do have your typical increases, but a lot of those are because of a COLA or giving the step raises, and we're really trying to keep those in, in place. So Now, you were critical of the step raises under the, the, uh, the, the big report that was done, the big uh, audit of what the salaries were. Yeah, I think you were kind of critical in some of the positions, but have you come around on that? Have you learned more about what the increases were and were they necessary? I wasn't necessarily against it, but what we were seeing was is that only certain pieces, it seemed, were implemented at that time. And I really think it wasn't so much the process. It was more so the lack of transparency. Um, what we're seeing, though, is that this Bolton study, and I think my new HR director has really done a great job at embracing this and realizing that it's not the end-all, be-all. It's a tool to use and it kind of gives you a scale to go off of. Um, we've made some salary adjustments. There were three people in Rhodes that had the experience um, but weren't given the proper salary. So we're really looking at that tool. So it is a decent tool, um, but it's not the end-all be-all, and it really needs to just be utilized as a tool rather than some sort of concrete thing that determines salaries. Um, and so I'm hoping that you know she's doing that um, as we move forward. But yeah, everything is based, it's kind of like a matrix. You know, you look at what the job code is, it's like, M35 and M40 or whatever, and then you go kind of this way on the years of experience and it gives you that range. Um, so I think when it's utilized properly, then I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have. Right. One of the areas of uh, contention between you and the council has been on the, the hiring front. Filling some of these jobs, there's been some awkward stuff in which they don't seem to understand it the way you do. Mm -hmm. So um, the way that it came about, especially with the public information officer, was um, I wanted to bring that position back as well for various reasons. I thought that person was a great media contact. Um, they could also kind of handle any PIA requests that came in. Um, but, um, and the way I was doing it, I, you know, I, I went down to finance. I talked to HR, like it's it's within the charter. So I couldn't really figure out what they were so upset about, but it is what it is. It ended up having to be a restructure. It ended up being three things that I was asking for. Um, I think 
um, from my perspective, it should have been three separate resolutions or three separate bills, um, but they put it all in one. And unfortunately, they shot every bit of it down. They didn't even introduce the bill. And in doing so, unfortunately, I won't be able to have that position. So it's not something that will be funded. And I actually probably do not plan to actually put it back in my budget again. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's really a wise choice because it'll just, I think, just cause more tension to have them strike it from the budget. Um, but it's interesting because when you talk to several of the council members, Members, they'll say, hey, I think the PIO is a great position. And I don't know if they realized some of the newer members that they could introduce the bill and then amend it. Um, but, you know, I mean, it is what it is. And like I said, we're moving forward. Um, and it is a shame because we were doing some really great things. So it's just a little bit more on mine and Bunky's plate until we get the assistant director of administration filled. Right. And it's, it's not just to glorify you. It also would help the council to have someone to put out information for the whole county. Yeah, exactly. So and actually, I've had a conversation with Mike Dunn and Bill Chambers and uh, they very much like the model that the city is doing with a communications director. So right. we've kind of looked at that as well. Um, I don't know if they necessarily know having this new study done, what you have to go through. So there's like a whole, especially when you create a new position, there's a lot of things that have to go into that. There's a whole document that you have to fill out and then you send it off to Bolton for them to do a grade for it. So it takes a little bit of time. And that's why it took so, I shouldn't say long, but that's what took so long to get it in front of the council was getting all of these different things in place and getting all of those pieces together um but you know i mean they were at work for like 11 days and 17 days before i literally had it on council agenda so um but you know i mean things just didn't work out that way so it's right. you know it's and okay. then the other position was the deputy uh, administration director correct um, you had a different vision for that for that role, and they didn't agree with the vision. So that's sort of been in a quandary right now. Yeah, I had, well, and it's sort of, the reason that I wanted it is when I was out on the campaign trail, public safety was a huge, huge topic. Um, we have a fire service agreement. We now have a police accountability board. We have a lot of things that fall under the realm of public safety. Um, you know, we were having issues with retention and retainment with our 911 dispatch, and it had nothing to do with Lorenzo or Chris Hopkins. Like, they do a fantastic job. Um, we were having issues with turnover rates of the jail. So all of these things sort of fell under this umbrella. And it was a position that I really thought was necessary. I wanted to keep in contact with our state's attorney and with our local uh, municipal police departments, our sheriff's office, um, and keep that open communication with them. And um, I knew I didn't want to create a whole new position. This would have been an eighty, ninety thousand dollars position, and I didn't want that to fall on taxpayers. So I kind of was going to revamp the assistant director of administration. Now, when Weston was in place, his specialty was public works. So he very right. much oversaw that. So I kind of viewed it the same way. This person's specialty will oversee kind of the, um, you know, the Department of Corrections and emergency services and kind of be this liaison between police and, you know, that kind of stuff. But um, they didn't like that. They didn't think that, and, and their argument was in the charter, it stays as assistant director sure. of administration. So I said that was fine. So when I put it forward, the complete title of the executive advisor of public safety, safety was struck. And then... Um, we move forward with just having the degree preferred, not required. And that opened up a lot of different doors. There were a lot of people that reached out, some that you may know very well, um, and I was actually super excited about um, possibly bringing in those people. And unfortunately, you know, they said no to that as well, to where the director of administration has to have a bachelor's degree, which was fine, um, but, it also kind of made people think that I already had somebody in mind for it. And you do. You know, when you come into sure. an administration, you know, you choose these people that you think are going to yeah. be the best for you. And um, unfortunately, you know, it kind of it kind of made it impossible. So um, in order to have the specific person that I thought about, um, it, but uh, well, we have interviews out or, you know, we've uh, sent out, um, we have interviews scheduled, I think, for two weeks from now. So or next week, I think that they're coming in for that. So we're looking for somebody for the outs from the outside. So now as a reporter, I love the transparency and I love that so much of that happened at the table, you mm -hmm. know, on pack 14 so everyone can see it. <laughs> but at the same yeah. time. For the overall image of the county and to get you off on the right start, would it have been better to work this stuff behind the scenes with them and, and sort of get a consensus before you made an issue of it? I feel like it would have. And it's hard, too, because um, the personnel part of it, um, it's very tricky in the charter because in the personnel, it basically says it's under the executive branch. Um, and there really shouldn't be any oversight in that. Um, and unfortunately, there's been some legislation passed that sort of dabbles into that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I have frustration with that because, I, you know, for me, I don't think I... 
if I was executive, I wouldn't have signed a bill, regardless if it went into law later on, um, but I would have vetoed something that kind of goes against the charter. So um, I don't particularly love that, but we're working through it, um, you know, in that aspect. And it's it's hard because you're trying to make people aware of something that are, um, and I know they're out working, but I kind of say it's two day a month. You know, we're here every day and they're here two days a month, you know, for meetings and things like that and trying to make them aware of what's happening. So, um, but we're working towards it, um, you know, trying to keep that communication open. I've opened up my doors. I actually have meetings with quite a few of them um, uh, of the council members so we'll be able to work through some things but in kind of in a roundabout way yes it probably would have behind doors been a little bit better and we met one time um, and then there was some meetings done between my attorney Paul Wilbur and then the council attorney and then they came forward with this bill and then didn't introduce it at all so the outside council hiring where you wanted Dan Cox the mm -hmm. former uh, Republican gubernatorial candidate in Maryland uh, and then the liquor board. So let's talk about Dan Cox first. Sure. So um, Dan, I, I think a lot of people looked at it as I was doing some sort of political favor. Dan Cox does not need a political favor from me. I mean, the man is the chief of staff right now for Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania. So he didn't need that. Um, Dan is a good attorney. Um, he is... Um, a constitutional attorney. I wanted somebody that I trusted. And I know that not everybody loves him. And I understand that there was this narrative created while he was running for candidacy. But again, and as I stated, the you have to set that aside. You know what I mean? The election is over. And, you know, everything that I'm doing right now is nonpartisan anyway. I mean, I'm up there fighting, you know, for environmental things. Like, what Republicans fighting for environmental stuff? But, you know, but I mean, the sanitary district and things like that. Sure. Because it's environmental health of our people. Um, and so... In that aspect, I was really hoping that they would set it aside. What more so frustrated me was one specific email, a cookie cutter email that was sent over and over and over again. And um, it was a hundred times to the council and I felt like they folded. And whether they really felt that way or not, that's how it appeared, um, especially not even having the discussion. And that worries me because I feel like that opens the door, I don't care what side you're on, that all we have to do to get our way is to just send 100 emails. And I, you know, and I was trying to reiterate to them that there are 107,000 people in this county. And if 100 of them are upset, that's less than 1%. Right. So if you really look at it in that aspect. But it is what it is, and they made that choice, and that choice is on record, and it is what it is. Um, I will find you know, a, a special counsel. I mean, but literally it's 5% of the legal work. I thought Dan would have been fine. And like I said, I wanted somebody that I trusted. And I trust him very much with that aspect of it. And so, um, but it's okay. You know what I mean? Like we're moving on and um, I'll find somebody else. It's okay. There's a couple other people that are pretty interested. So. And then you finally had the guts to take on the dispensary system, yes. which is something mm -hmm. you've gotten a lot of feedback while you were running. Mm -hmm. People talk about this all the time. We've talked about it for years in the county. The dispensary system really doesn't have a lot of accountability anywhere. Yes. Um, and you want to try to bring some accountability, change the way things are done. Um, I think in the end, it's going to end up being however long it takes, what you have envisioned. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I was very vocal about it. I am a big supporter of small businesses and our restaurants are hurting. I mean, they were hurting from COVID. They're just coming out of that. And so um, this was something that I felt was important to them. And when you look across the county, or I'm sorry, when you look across the state and you see that we are one of two counties that are still doing this archaic system, this four-tiered system, um, and the other county was Montgomery, you know, you kind of start to analyze, okay, well, we're nothing like Montgomery County. We really aren't. I mean, size-wise, it's just we're nothing like it. And so I really wanted to move away from that system. Now, in doing so, I knew it was going to be controversial. I didn't realize how controversial it was going to be. So um, I do feel that it is in the best interest. I'm actually kind of um, as much as back and forth that we did on how we're going to do this, I'm actually happy we didn't um, ram it through legislation because you want to get something like that right. Liquor laws are convoluted and books are this thick, you know, sitting on the shelf. So we want to make sure that we get it right. So yes, um, I met with Bill Chambers and Mike Dunn and they are going to do a task force very similar to what we did with the water and sewer plan. They have a lot of different stakeholders coming in and speaking and I have decided to remove myself from that. There might be somebody from my office, Bunky may come in and might end up being this new director of administration, but somebody who kind of has, you know, more of... A, who wasn't as vocal as I was about it um, because I think that that's only fair and I will adhere to whatever they kind of come up with you know as as what we should do um, from the community because it is about the community. From the state of the county I've, I was impressed with with a bunch of things from that um, obviously but uh, Lori Carter's nine-point plan to make things more friendly 
um, to the customers that come in and people to understand how hard it is to work with planning and zoning if you're a developer or a builder, uh, an architect, um, anyone. But she's made a commitment here. She has. And I was super happy to see that. I had a conversation with each one of the department heads when I first was elected. And I told them, I said, I'm going to reiterate what's coming from the public. Some of it's great and some of it's not great, but I think that you need to hear it and we need to work through that. Um, but you are the department head. I, you know, I'm not coming in and telling you how to do your job by any means, but I'm letting you know this is the perception. And you know, when I met with Lori and with Keith Hall, who's our deputy director, um, you know, they understood that the public, you know, it was frustrated. I said, you know, people are taking it's two years to get a permit. Right. You know, I my husband talked about building a pole building, and I said, oh my gosh, let me get an office first so that right. we can get it taken care of. But I didn't want people to have that, uh, you know, mindset. I didn't want people to think that way, you know, and I don't want people to think that we are not there to serve them. And so they have. I just have to give them both props because they have worked so hard in that department to really help people. And I told them, I said, you know, people want to come back one time. I'd love everything to be on the website of what they need to bring, but if they come in and they need to, I don't want them to have to come back 50 times and right. bring this piece of paper, bring this, your blood type, you need this, you need that, <laughs> right. you know, whatever it is to build, you know, or whatever it is that they need. And so we've really been working towards that, um, you know, working towards those goals. And I've heard it from the community that they have felt a lot, you know, better energy you know, coming in there. So, yeah. So I was really happy with that. Um, and it's posted and it kind of reflects what Governor Hogan did. Right. Um, you know, and so um, on uh, Thursday, uh, Boyd Rutherford came and spoke um, at an event right. that I had. And um, and he kind of mentioned that as well, that you kind of mirrored what we did. And I think that it's it's a good thing. I think people are happy to see that. Uh, and of course, I love Steve Miller. I'm glad he stayed. Mm -hmm. um, of all the department heads I work with, I, I work with a lot of them, but I, I work with him a lot on things because he's always got projects that need coverage and ideas where they want citizen feedback on things. Um, and I thought his presentation was great. And I got really excited about some of these things that are in the pipeline. Yes, yes. A lot of ribbon cuttings I get to go to. But <laughs> right. yes, seeing that, yes, Steve, I don't think I realized how much Rec and Parks and Tourism yeah. really covers and then with the Civic Center. So I think I knew, but it's like when you really, when he is, I mean, he's all over the place. Yeah. He'll be up in Conley Mill looking at something and he'll be down at Cove Road. He'll be at the Civic Center and he's here and there. And we, you know, we had brought, um, I decided to do an employee of the month and department of the month. And he, I mean, just hands down was chosen because of all the things that they're doing. Switching out floors, you know, from junior, you know, you're starting with like rodeo and then it's monster trucks and then junior achievement and things like that. So they uh, just work. I mean, just well, I, around the clock, crazy. I, I remember you were kind of alarmed when you realized that county employees had to go to the Civic Center to put the dirt in for the monster truck show. Yes, well, it was just kind of funny. It was kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, you're not even realizing yeah. that that's happening, yeah. you know. And, and my, my point with that was that we all work together. And so that might not be in their wheelhouse to bring dirt in for right. the Civic Center, but kind of showing that other duties assigned means that you do whatever it is to help, right. you know. But yeah, so Steve, yes, we are very lucky to have him. And we're excited about pickleball. I'd really like to bring some sort of regional tournament here, um, you know, and kind of really focus on that. That has just taken the world by storm. So I don't I don't know if you play or not. But I, I do. I enjoy it a lot. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I haven't played yet, but uh, apparently um, apparently I, I need to, I guess, because I'm kind of being left out here. So, um, so yeah, pickleball. And then, like I said, we have the expansion of Cove Road happening. So that's very exciting. Um, I think uh, the college is partnered up with him and I think T-Pain is coming so, to the Civic Center. So yeah, he's got a lot going on. So we're really super happy to have him. Of all the things that the county does, the, the one that has always surprised me is the the jail, the detention center. And you have a new warden coming in. Mm -hmm. Had you ever been in the detention center before you got elected? No, no. What, for good reason. What was, what, <laughs> I would hope not. What was your first impression when you went in it? Were, weren't you amazed by that thing? Yeah, well, so I did do a tour while I was campaigning okay. because I kind of wanted to see what was going on. And I didn't even really know the process. And things have changed so much. COVID changed a lot of things. And I wanted to really be kind of up to date on what was happening with the jail. Um, and I am excited. She actually starts today. Chris Tyler okay. starts today as the new warden. So I'm very excited about that. And she's kind of coming back home. So she is from here. She worked at ECI and then worked at uh, the detention center and went up to Easton and now is back. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Um, but how the situation works, it's funny because in a lot of other places, uh, the sheriff's office or the sheriff kind of over right. oversights that. Um, I'd be, <laughs> there were times where I was happily just hand it to him. You just take it, but he's got <laughs> enough on his plate right now. Um, but no, I, I did not know. And um, it's kind of crazy the turnover that we have there yeah. as well. You know, if people are only in there for a short Hard amount of time. Hard job. 
Very hard job. Very hard job. Very hard job. I am hoping, though, there's a lot, there's a couple things that we have hopefully to bring back. We'd like the crews to come back out, you know, kind of cleaning up the area, cleaning up the recycle center. Um, We're actually hoping to do some sort of partnership with ECI where nonviolent offenders might be able to come out and do some work release programs with us in our roads department or in in a department where they can actually earn a paycheck um, and have some money set aside for when they, when they are released, that they have something. So we have something in the works, you know, sort of looking at that as well. One thing, just a piece of advice uh, with budget coming up, mm-hmm. uh, Pam Oland on Thursday gave a report and said another $17 million had been put into reserve. Um, and I think your number's up around $50 million now. Mm-hmm. So everyone's going to come at you and go, you why are we sitting on all this money? Yeah. You know, so do you have a number that we need to maintain for rainy day? Or, or how, how do you process that in your head? So it's kind of crazy. So to me, I, you know, think about, you know, I think we would be okay with like 30 or 40 million, you know. <laughs> right. But what I learned is our salary cap messes with us a lot. Or the, sorry, the, the, uh, revenue, the, cap. the revenue cap, not salary cap, the, uh, the revenue cap kind of messes with us. Yeah. So. Um, It is important for us to keep that bank account pretty full. And when I met with PKS, they very much took us through the process as to what that bank account should look like. And it should be steadily increasing. And PKS is the county's auditor. Yes, correct. Sorry. Yes, I always forget that. Not everybody knows that. But yes, so PKS, you know, has said that this is how it should go. Um, this is the first time in a long time that we have had a very good report. Um, and I don't know if that's Pam or whatever, but I'm just going to go with it. And so they're very happy with how the flow is going. Um, and the issue is our bond rating is what it is because of the amount of money that we have. Um, and so we want to keep that, but our bond rating will not get too much it will not get much better because we have right. the revenue cap. And that is something I did not know right. is that, you know, people and, and I'm, you know, and I don't want anybody to think that I'm, you know, going to come take this away. <laughs> but it does sort of like in a, from a financial standpoint, yeah. it does handcuff you a little bit. And the way that banks or, you know, other places or people that are lending you money look at it is, well, you can't tax your way out of your issue. Right. And I know people are cheering like, yes, you know, you can. But when you're trying to borrow money and things like that. The bondholders would like you to have that access. They, yes, yeah. to be able to have that as, as an yeah. option. Um, but I know our citizens don't want that. So, you know, but it is what it is. So you have to be creative. And so having the money in the account is actually very important. Are you having fun? What do you want to do next? Yeah, so I, I am having fun. I have a spring project that I'm going to be working on, um, and I don't really mind sharing it. So um, what I have noticed is the lack of health equity in our county, meaning that we have so many different places that people have to go to get services for the health department. So we have the spot next to Mogan's, we have Waverly, we have E.S. Atkins, and what I am very much looking forward to doing is trying to combine all of that into one location um, and create public access to that, you know, re- rerouting some transportation and being able to have everything in one place. And I think that that will be very beneficial. Um, and, uh, and I think it'll also uh, keep people, you know, you are walking into this one building and nobody really knows what you're going in for. When you have everything segregated, people can kind of guess exactly what you're going in for. So we're looking at that as well. So that's going to be my my next project and sort of combining those efforts. So we'll see. How can people get a hold of you? Uh, well, you can type in my name right on the website now, but no, they can go to uh, WacomicoCounties.org. Um, you can, you know, obviously call the office. Um, you know, I'm, I have two amazing uh, women in there that will get you to me. Or they can email me, which is uh, jgiordano at WacomicoCounty.org. And you're on the community so much. Pump, you know, all you got to do is go to an event. You'll run, you'll run into yeah, you I'll probably at be some there. point. Yeah, at some point. <laughs> no, and I like being there. I like being out in the community. That's actually like one of the best parts of the job is being able to have fun with the community and see them in different aspects, whether it's a fire hall or a run that we're doing or something like that. So I like that part. She's Julie Giordano. She's our county executive. Just celebrated 100 days of service in the, to the county, and we're thrilled she had time to be this here today. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm Greg Bassett from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper, another edition of 101 right here on Pack 14.
First Shore Federal is proud to support PAC-14 and one-on-one. -on -one. We'd encourage every business to support PAC-14 and, and pick a program and support it and let's make a difference.